Awesome. So, cool. Thanks very much, Amit. Cheers. Thanks, JS Channel, for having me here. So, effective Node.js debugging. This sounds really boring. I'll be honest, this sounds like a very boring topic. Um, if there's one thing McKinsey's taught me is really important, it's managing the expectations of people. So, I'll be honest with you guys. 100%, this is going to blow your minds and melt your brains. We're going to go sick house. We're going to do Vim, we're going to do Tmux, we're going to do Docker. It's going to be crazy. It's going to be the best thing you've ever seen. I'll also be honest that I've been given the feedback many times that I'm not very good at expectation management. <laughs> okay, so let me introduce myself. My name's Dave Kerr. I work for Digital McKinsey. Um, I'm based in Singapore. I've actually uh, lived in Europe, lived in the US. I lived in Bangalore for six months in Koromangala. Um, I am, as I said, a nerd. I'm one of the few sort of hardcore tech guys who works in Singapore at the moment. I work with big enterprise clients doing technology and trying to get them to transform their ways to become faster, to become more agile. Um, this little picture is funny in my mind. I'm based in Singapore, so for me that means, for Digital McKinsey, that means coding on planes. Because in Singapore, we're here, and all our clients are in Indonesia, and Vietnam, and Thailand, so I spend a lot of time coding on planes. So one of the reasons debugging is quite important for me, because I don't have a Wi-Fi connection, so I actually have to like, fix things myself, which is a pain. So my history with, with development and programming was, as a kid, I was really into computer games, and at about the age of 10, I read that to make computer games, you have to learn a language called C. So I started learning a language called C. And then from that point onwards, I just learned more and more and more. So I started off doing the sort of traditional imperative programming and systems programming in C. And then moved on to C++ with object-orientated programming and a whole different set of patterns there. And then as years went on, I learned a bunch of different languages and a bunch of different patterns as well, things like functional programming. Um, started working more and more with databases, writing servers and writing clients and everything in between. So I do a lot of different stuff and I try to, to mix that up. And one of the things that I'm really excited about and passionate about is I like to share what I do. So I do a lot of coding, but I also do a lot of teaching. I do a lot of blogging. I do a lot of writing. I work a lot with teams trying to get people to learn new and exciting technologies. And that's a really fun thing. Um, you can follow me on Twitter, you can check my blog on dwmcur.com, you can look at some of my code on GitHub. You can also check out my charity. I run a charity with my girlfriend which is called Support for Nepal. We unsurprisingly provide support for people in Nepal. Um, in fact, I think we've got some people from Nepal who've come to the conference, haven't we? Anyone from Nepal here? Hey, hey guys. Kecha? <laughs> um, nice to see you, nice to see you here. So, tell me one. Looking good so far. So why do I care enough about Node.js to go to the effort of spending, it took me 45 minutes to prepare this presentation, so I'm hoping it will take 45 minutes to, to present it. Why do I care enough about Node.js to go to this effort? Node is quite interesting because on one hand it's a terrible idea, and on the other hand it's a really brilliant idea. It's a kind of ugly duckling that it shouldn't really make sense, but in many ways it really does. Um, and why do I say that? So the traditional way of building software on distributed systems is that you have something like a browser or a client, and it goes to a server, and then it goes to a database. And maybe you have millions of clients, and thousands or hundreds of servers, and a few different databases. And then someone came along and said, oh, we're going to build this thing, Node.js, and what are we going to do? We're going to take that browser and we're going to put it in the server. We're going to take the V8 engine, which executes JavaScript in the Chrome browser and put it on a server. What? That's, that's ridiculous. You're going to take a JavaScript execution engine from Chrome and start running it on servers. This is madness. This is nonsense. Um, and it's nonsense for a load of reasons. One of them is that, sorry, JS channel, JavaScript is a terrible language in many ways. In many ways, JavaScript is, is shit. It has no support for modules. You know, you've got Webpack and you've got um, Require and all this stuff, because in a browser, you can't even get JavaScript into separate files to work together nicely. That's horrendous. In a time when JavaScript was becoming popular, where lots of people were doing Java and .NET and C++, which were all about object-oriented programming, Java had no classes or inheritance. Java doesn't support any kind of threads. 
um, sorry, JavaScript doesn't. There was no standardized platforms. Different browsers were executing JavaScript in different ways. There's weird stuff, like JavaScript has all this type coercion stuff, which is just disgusting. Like if I put the string true and compare it to the Boolean true, it compares to be the same. Duh, sorry, that's just, that's wild, that's crazy. There's no decimal types. Everything in JavaScript is a 32-bit or 64-bit floating point number, which makes doing anything mathematical a pain. And the list goes on and on and on. So in many ways, JavaScript has some serious flaws. And it was designed for doing DOM manipulation. It was designed for moving this div from here to there, or taking this span and putting a new class on it. It wasn't necessarily designed to run on a server. Uh, there's a little XKCD comic there that shows like what would happen if he wrote his own language, and that's what I think JavaScript is like sometimes. So in many ways, JavaScript is a terrible language, but in many ways, it is a fantastic language as well. JavaScript has zero support for modules. Okay, fine. On the browser, that is still a pain in the ass, and I'm sorry, guys who do UI, it's going to be a pain in the ass for a while, but on the server, it's not a problem. We can use um, standard patterns. JavaScript has zero support for classes and traditional object-orientated inheritance, that's actually a great thing because people have abused object-orientated programming heavily. Um, putting everything into an object and an object that has functionality is a pattern that people kind of jumped onto and then just did and did and did and did as a knee-jerk reaction, and it doesn't always make sense. JavaScript is quite elegant in its simplicity there. JavaScript has zero support for threads. This is fantastic. Most people I've worked with who are new to Node.js write more efficient servers than expert Java and C++ and .NET developers quite quickly and easily because it has an event-driven, non-blocking model. It actually means that you can write very, very, very efficient code very easily. And a lot of the stuff that makes programming hard, like mutexes and semaphores and synchronization, you just don't have to worry about. You just write. Um, everything is single-threaded and everything is re-entrant. And it makes writing efficient code actually very, very easy. On the server, we have a standardized platform, the V8 engine. We still have some rubbish, you know, we still have bizarre type coercion, but we can fix that with things like ESLint and good coding practices. We can use strict mode, and we still don't have decimal types, but that's okay. We can get around that with a few, with a few different things. Um, and the platform is fantastic as well. The V8 engine is probably one of the most sophisticated pieces of software that's actively, actively being used at the moment. The V8 engine optimizes and de-optimizes code dynamically based on what's happening. It compiles things down to bytecode and assembly. It's extremely fast and it's extremely efficient. It's very lightweight as well. Running V8 is much quicker than running the Java runtime or the .NET runtime. It's very small. Like V8 is something like 20 megabytes something like this. Um, it's very quick to start up, and that's an important thing as well as people move more towards things like microservices, where you want small, lean runtimes and many instances of them. It's quite easy to manage. When I first started doing some Java programming, I spent so long downloading Java runtime environments and setting environment variables to Java homes and class paths, and I, I don't think I ever actually got it right. And it's also not Java. Uh, which is nice. Java is actually very difficult to work with. It has a great use case for many things, but it's also very complicated and it comes with a lot of stuff. If you're doing Java programming, are you using Maven, are you using Gradle, are you using Eclipse, are you using Spring? There's a lot of stuff there. JavaScript and, and V8 is lean. All of these things together mean that Node and JavaScript are a very good choice for things like experimentation, and microservices and DevOps 2.0. It's lean, it's quick, it's easy, it doesn't require a huge amount of expertise, you can get started in no time. So it's a, it's a great language to learn, it's a great tool to use. Now moving on to the, um, the meat of this, why, why debugging? So debugging is very important. It makes us better programmers because it helps us to understand what's actually going on in code. We can get down into the guts of it and see what's really happening. It makes us more valuable programmers as well more viable programmers. Um, there's nothing that's more important than that team member that can help you when stuff is really going wrong and you have no idea why. And that's when being able to really get into the depths of things is very, very important. Before I continue, before I forget, um, I'm just going to take a quick interlude. I said I'd take a picture for my mum. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to do that right now. So Sorry, you have to sit around while I do this, guys. Smile. Thank you very much. I'll post that to her, she'll be delighted. Um, next thing before I continue, could everyone just stand up?
yes, I have the power to make you do things. Can everyone put one hand on their head? No, that's okay. Um, so please, sit down if you think that, and this is absolutely fine, at no time in your professional career you're probably going to be using Node.js. Maybe you're like a manager, you're not really going to be actively developing. Okay, so most of us p could potentially be using Node.js. Sit down if you've never used Node.js, if it's something you maybe have an aspiration to. Oh my God, so everyone here has used Node.js. So sit down if you, if you would say that you're not necessarily very good at get really getting into debugging Node.js live. Like really getting into it. Okay, so a few people sitting down, but lots of people quite comfortable. Okay, fantastic. So loads of people here have got some interest in Node.js, and loads of people have got, you can all sit down now, thank you very much. I was also secretly, just between you and me, doing that to make sure everyone's like awake and, and alive and following things. I secretly doing that, um, yeah, to make sure you're, you're still, still paying attention. So there's some people who've done lots of Node.js debugging, there's some people who've done a little, that's good. I've got demos for and, and code for both of us for beginners, but also I'm going to go on to some more sophisticated stuff. So we'll start off with just a simple script, and then we'll start talking about how you can debug things like microservices, Docker containers, in container development and everything. Doing a quick time check, I said to myself I'd give myself 15 minutes of talking before we get into it, so that's about the right time to get moving. So the first demo, live coding, I'm really nervous about this, it's gonna be hard, but then again it's debugging, so it's not supposed to work, but I think it's gonna be a disaster. The first thing I'm gonna debug is a very simple happy JS server. So this server, I basically copied and pasted the, the kind of introduction page to happy JS, and then I added some code on top, which I wasn't really sure if it would work, and that's a great way for me to start introducing debugging because I don't think it's going to work. It didn't work when I ran it. How, how can I discover what's going on? Well, I can just get into the code and start, start actually doing it. So here we go to the live coding demo. Get your popcorn out because it's, it's going to be hilarious. Okay, so we have item. Let's just, can everyone see this okay? Maybe make it a bit bigger. Let's get Tmux open and move this out of the way. So if anyone's interested, all of this code is available on GitHub, DWM Cur, Effective Node.js Debugging. That's where the repo lives. If you want the code, you can take a look at it there. There's also other bits and pieces. And I'm gonna go into demo one. And what do we have? Okay, so in this folder, we've got some very basic stuff. We've got a readme file. I don't know what's in there. I don't think I wrote it. We've got a package.json and a server file. That's another thing. You know, this is the elegance of Node. Many projects are just as slim and simple as that, especially if you're building things like microservices. You don't need much more than this. So what have we got here? This is the kind of usual happy JS boilerplate. If you've never used happy, it's just like Express. It's a way of writing web servers. It's a way of writing REST APIs. So I'm going to create a server that's going to live on 000. It's going to expose itself through port 8123. And I've got this fake database that I've made. This database contains Homer, Marge, and Bart, three of the Simpsons. Then what else have I got? Let's go down. I have defined a root, a pair of roots. The first one is a get on the root, and it's going to reply and say, hello, JS channel. The next one is a search, and I've written this get person function, which is going to take the ID, and it's going to search for that person and try and return that, the appropriate Simpson. And that's the code that I'm not really sure about. That's the code I wrote without really thinking and just going to see what happens. And this is the actual get person function itself. It's going to return a promise. And what we're going to do is we're going to search through... Oh, I've nearly lost myself there. That would have been funny. We're going to search through the database to try and find the person whose ID has been passed into the function, and then we're going to pass that person back. And that's basically it. That's the program. So let's run it up. I'll just make sure I've got everything installed. So just to, just to be honest with you guys, a little bit nervous because of all the live coding. So every time I'm waiting for something to spin, I'm just going to imagine you all naked. So now you're all as uncomfortable as I am. This is after me saying how great Node.js is. It's Wi-Fi. It's a killer. I've got time to text my mum that picture. I'll, I'll send it to her now. If she replies, I'll let you know what she says. Okay. 
think Amit is sort of thinking here, why did I let this guy come along? All right, while we're waiting for that to do its thing, let's just open up another little window. So what I'm going to do to test the server when it runs is I'm going to run HTTP. This is the HTTP, HTTP Pi tool. It's just like curl, but it's a little bit cleaner. I'm going to hit the local host on 8123. And at the moment, it's not connecting because nothing's built, because the Wi-Fi is so slow. But once the server is running, it should show that hello JS channel message. And then afterwards, I'm going to do the, um, the Simpsons API. So let's do npm start now. So our server's running. It says it's, it's just sitting there, 8123, and it's ready to rock. So let's see. OK, so I sent a request to the server, and it's bounced back saying, hello, JS channel. Notice in my server, or you might not have noticed, I didn't put any logging, any console output. So it's quite difficult for me to reason about what's going on as the server's running. And that's where the debugging is going to become important. Now, if I go back to the code, I can see that there is a Simpson with ID1, who is Homer. So based on the APIs I wrote, I should be able to go to search, question mark, ID equals 1. And it says, can't find that Simpson. So somewhere I've done something wrong. In theory, if I was right, it should have discovered that ID1 was Homer and bounced it back. So now what we're going to do is um, start debugging this. So. Back to the presentation briefly, there are, there are three approaches to debugging in this scenario. There is the philosopher's approach, which is I'm going to read the code, and I'm going to think about the code very hard, and I'm going to read the documentation, and then I'm going to make one change that fixes it, which doesn't work. There's the, there's the panic attack approach, which is the code, you fill it full of console log statements, I am starting, I have received a request, the request ID is one. And it's like the code's having a panic attack and you're trying to talk them through it carefully, don't worry, I'm here for you. That's actually really hard. And this is one of the reasons I wanted to do this presentation, because I was working with colleagues and from time to time I'd see people banging their head against a brick wall, and then what they would do is I'd see people start to do this, console.log, and it's like, okay, so we are starting and then furiously putting a lot of these console log statements in. And it's, it's OK a little bit, but it actually gets very time consuming. And you have to put more and more logging in, and you have to start logging variables, and you still can't see what's going on. Then there is the last approach, which is to debug it, which is fun because it's coding, and we all like coding. And you're working with your code, and you're not reading, or philosophizing, or panic attacking. So this is the magic trick. Very, very easy. npm install save node inspector, and I'll talk about what node inspector is in a bit, a bit more detail shortly. So the first thing I'm going to do is install node inspector. Node inspector is the little tool that's going to allow us to get into the, um, the depths of our code. Everyone here familiar with node inspector used it before? Some people? Wave, wave, wave and wave if you've used node inspector. OK, cool. So some people have, but some people haven't. That's fantastic. Node inspector, um, Later on, once you've done a bit more of the code, I'm going to show you a diagram of how it actually works and what it's doing and why it's doing. It's also going to become obsolete fairly soon. I'll give you the details on that. But Node Inspector is what's going to help us do our coding. So while it's installing, let's go to our it's control B Z. Let's go to our package.json and I'm going to add a new script. And I have this script in every Node.js project I write. The script is debug. So npm run debug is going to start my code up in a way where I can actually start running it and working with it. So what's it going to do? I'm going to run node debug server.js. It's still installing. That's OK. Let's just write that down. So this is going to run the node debug program, which is going to run server.js. And again, I'm going to explain what node debug is and, and prove to you that it's not kind of black magic. Um, once we've done a little bit of working with this. So now it's doing the installer, it's falling back to compile. OK, super. So now what I should be able to do is npm run debug to start my code in debug mode. Wow, look at that. This is cool. So this is Node Inspector. What it's doing is it's giving me, and the UI guys as well as the server side guys should be familiar with this now, it's giving me the, um, the Blink Web Tools debugger API. So I can go to my code, which is here, and I can look at the stuff that's going on. 
and I can stick a breakpoint in at the get person and see if anything weird's happening there, and I can stick a breakpoint in on the handler I've written. These are the, the dev tools. I can do console.log, hi, it's got to have a closing brackets. I can do whatever I want to do here. I can watch stuff, and I'm going to show you some of the cool things you can do. But the cool thing is, that took, how long did it take to kind of put that line of code in? Like, I don't know, half a minute or whatever. But now, and forever more, this program I can debug easily. So I've got the debugger attached. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to do that same HTTP call. Connection error, max retries exceeded. Running on Node.js, debugger list on port 123. Okay, so the reason it's done a connection error is by default, no debug when it starts. It starts your program broken at the first point. I actually need to continue it so that the server actually starts up. So the first line of JavaScript it encounters, it pauses, ready for you to set your breakpoints and do everything like this. Now I should be able to call the API. Okay, awesome. And look at that, it's got a notification. It's told me that the debugger is paused and I can click on it, and I can see what's happening. So I'm in my code. I mean, this is, this is quite easy to do, but already I'm in the code. I can look at something like the request. OK, so the request looks like it's an object. Maybe we can run something here. We've got request, all right. And I'm checking the params. What's params? It's an object. What does it contain? Uh, it doesn't contain anything, so that could be what's going on, because ID is undefined. So I've asked it to find the Simpson with ID 1, and that's not going through. But I can also start playing around now. So I can take a look and say, was it request.params? Because I kind of just guessed that. What else have we got? We've got payload, query, oh, query. It's a query string that I've put it in. And there's a query there, which is ID 1. So if we just change that to um, query, then what we should see is that request.query ID is equal to 1. So I've discovered at least the first part of the bug. I'm going to go back to the code, and I'm going to make the changes, and then I'm going to show you how you can make it even more optimized. So back to the code. Let's go to here. So what did we discover? We discovered that request.params was wrong. So it's not params, it's query. Now, that was a bit of a pause in the flow. You know, people talk a lot about programming, how you've got to stay in the flow. I had to stop debugging and kind of come back here, and I'm going to have to start it again. A little trick that we can do um, when we're working on our code is if we go back to the package.json, we can provide a few parameters to node debug. And the parameter that I'm looking for is enable live edits, I believe it is. Let me just take a look. Node enable live edit. Node inspector. This is one of those things I probably should have written down, but that's OK. Save live edit. OK. So when I do save live edit, all it means is that I can actually edit my code in Chrome and just save it straight back to the disk which means that I can, I can actually be changing my code in the debugger, rerunning my HTTP requests, and just keep on doing that until I get it right. So let's see again. Make sure I've just saved it. So back here, let's just kill Node Inspector. And let's start it again, run debug. We've got the save live edit flag. One thing you'll notice about um, Node Inspector is it can be a little bit flaky when you restart things. So when that happens, you just need to, to refresh. So again, first line of JavaScript is here. We'll let that continue. I've got my breakpoint here on my get person code, and I've got my breakpoint on my request query. So let's do an HTTP request and see if we can find Homer Simpson. Debugger is paused. We've got request. Query ID. So we can do the usual step in. Let's step all the way to here. So we're going to do DB find on this ID. Uh, what time are we on? I'm going to speed it up a little bit. So one thing you, the observant of you might have noticed is that this is a string. It's not an, a number. So when it tries to do finding, it's not going to discover that Homer is the guy with ID 1 because I've passed in the string 1. But because I've done the live edit, what I can do is I can just say that, well, where have we got it? 
where I'm passing in this request query ID, I'll let the first query fail. So it did a timeout. Let's just run it and give it enough time to actually go through and fail. It can't find that Simpson. That's because of the fact that um, it's a string. So now I'll do the code again. But what I'm going to do is parse int request query ID. Hit save. And it's updated the code. And it's found Homer Simpson. And it's updated my code live on the file system. So when I'm working on a thorny problem, I can, I can get the feedback time from trying something and experimenting something and saving it back to my hard disk and running it down really, really low. I didn't even need to restart the server. V8 is smart enough to recompile the underlying code and, and execute it again. So if there's one thing that you can take away from this presentation, it is that if you're not used to using Node Inspector, npm install Node Inspector and add a debug script to your packages, and you've got a very, very easy way to, to get started looking into the internals of your code. And these tools, the development tools here, are very, very powerful, and we'll see a little bit more about them. So that was demo one. Which one? OK, it didn't all explode like I expected. Thank you. That was very kind. I got a little, a little bit of a clap there. So for anyone who needs it, the presentation is also on GitHub. I've put the instructions of what I did, like what I described was happening there. Right, so for the guys who've already used Node Inspector and the guys who are very good at debugging, you're sitting there thinking, fuck, this is baby stuff. Okay, so let's, let's make it a bit more sophisticated. We've been talking about microservices, so Dave's MacBook Pro is running Docker. My Docker host is my MacBook Pro, which is 127001. How am I doing that ma magic? It's because I've got the Docker for Mac Beta. Um, if you're interested, there's a couple of links. Um, to my blog there, where I describe the Docker for Mac Beta, how it works, how much better it is, as well as this entire stack. If you've never written a microservice, then this article I've written describes, like, from step zero, how you can get there. So I'm going to have three things running in Docker. I'm going to have a database, I'm going to have a service, and I'm going to have an integration test. The database is going to be MySQL, and it's going to store the Simpsons and their phone numbers. So it's going to store Homer and his phone number, Marge and their phone number. The service is going to allow me to look up someone's phone number based on their email address. So if I have Homer's email address, I want to take his phone number, maybe so I can send him an SMS. And the integration test is going to test that it all works. So this is, I wrote this using test-driven development, but not unit test-driven development, really actually starting with the inter integration test. So I want to make an HTTP call and look up a phone number. The other things to be aware of is that on the Docker containers, I have mounted my code as a volume, which means when I change my code on my computer, the Docker container updates its code. And if I'm running something like Nodemon, it reruns, it reloads the code. So this is called in-container development. I also describe that in one of the, um, the articles on, on my site. It means that I don't need to rebuild my Docker containers while I'm changing the code in them. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Let's take a quick look at the code and see. So I need to take it out of presentation mode, I think, for you to see. OK. Back to the terminal. Let's make it full screen. So let's just quit some of these windows. And we'll get rid of this one as well. In fact, I just need to kill that server. All right, so let's go to demo two. So demo2 contains three folders, one for the database, one for the user's service, and one for the integration test. And it contains a Docker Compose file, which for each of these different things, which will build a Docker container, it will spin them all up and connect them to each other. If you haven't used Docker, uh, don't worry about it. But, but get into it, because there's, it's, it's very exciting and powerful with what it can do. So let's just take a quick look at the database, first of all. My database is nothing more than a SQL file and a Docker file. The Docker file is saying, based on the MySQL image, I'm going to use some basic configuration data, create a database called users with a SQL, um, MySQL user and a password. So all this Docker container does is just starts up SQL Server running in a box, and it runs um, a setup SQL script, which, if we look at that, creates a table called directory, and it adds some Simpsons into them. So we've got Homer and his phone number. We've got Marge and her phone number. We've got Maggie and her phone number, so on and so on. So this is my little database. This is one of the reasons Docker is so great, because if I want to run that database, I can just go into, I'm in this test database. I can just do docker build, what is here, and it will create my Docker container. And I can do docker run. It builds a container. It's called 229. 
to E. And I've got a MySQL database running in a nice little container that I can connect to. I didn't even need to install MySQL on my computer. Very easy. So let's just kill all of that while it's starting up. Uh, no, let's do BC. Let's stop what I just started there, which is 0B. Oh. Docker has this um, habit, if you don't give a container a name, it gives them little names for you. So I need to stop the container I just started, which is called Cocky Right. Whimsical. OK, so we looked at the test database. Let's look at the service. Now, the service is important because this is the Node.js code, and this is why we're here at JS channel to talk about JavaScript. So this server has a Docker file as well. It has an index uh, and a config and an API. It's a little bit more involved. Let's check on the time. I don't know if we've got enough time to go into all the details. Um, no, I don't have enough time. So I'm just going to show you a little bit of the code. It's a little bit involved. So if we go to Vim index, this is an Express.js server. It's loading up some configuration data. It's going to connect to a database. It's going to start a server. It's got some routes and some APIs. And the API I'm interested in is this one. So I have a route where if I do an HTTP GET on the string users, I'm going to hit my database. And then I'm going to send all those users back. And I have an, app, um, an API, which is search where I take a query string and I search for the email query string and I return the user who is um, from that. So let's see if we can get this right. In theory, I can just run the whole lot up now. And I have an integration test, which um, is very easy to see. In fact, we'll take a look at that now as well. Integration test just has uh, something like this. So what's it going to do? It's going to call my search API with Homer at the Simpsons.com and expect to find Homer Simpson. And it's going to search for Marge and expect to find Marge. And if it searches for Bender at Futurama.com, he's not in the database, it expects to find no one and expects to get a 404 back. So. All of these different things are held together with a Docker Compose file, which I will show you as well. What it's saying here is, first of all, we're going to have a database, which is going to build that database image, test database image. Then we're going to have a user service, which is going to build from the user service folder. It's going to expose port 8123. It's going to have some volumes. It's going to depend on the database, and it's going to set an environment variable. And then we have the integration tests, which are going to depend on the service itself. So when I hit Docker Compose, what's going to happen is that it's going to spin all of this stuff up and create it. So Docker Compose build, first of all. That's going to build the database image. It's going to build the services image. It's going to build the integration tests image. And then when I do Docker Compose up, it's going to set the whole stack up. And my tests are written using Mocha. And it's set to watch the tests. So it's just going to sit there, run the tests once. And every time I change the test code, it's then going to rerun the tests. Only it might not, because it's taking so long to build. I think it's talking across the network here. OK, so it's building the services. While we're doing that, um, is it 12.15 this one finishes at? I think so. While we're, build while we're doing that, while we're building it, um, how, how would I do Node Inspector on this? Basically, I would follow exactly the same patterns as what I've done before. So I would go to my user's service, which is here. Within the user's service code, I'm going to do npm install node inspector. While it's doing that, I will also update my package JSON. I'm running out of uh, running out of windows for this. CD users service, vim package JSON. Let's maximize that. So I will change my code so that I have a debug as well. So a debug command is going to run node debug against index.js. 
And then all I need to do is just update my Docker file, which is the, that's the wrong Docker file. We need the Docker file for the user's service, demo two. So Node Inspector, I don't know if you noticed, exposes its data on port 8080. That's what my browser is going to connect to. So I just need to expose one more port. So let's expose 8080. And instead of doing npm start, I need to do run debug. And that's it. All that that means is that when I start my containers up now, they will start with a debugger. OK, so it's built everything. Let's just do docker compose up. So this is going to start the whole network up. Oops. Docker compose up. So it's going to start up the MySQL database. It's going to run the startup script, which is going to add the data to the database. It's going to start up the user service, which is sitting there ready to take HTTP requests and talk to the database. And it's going to start up the integration tests, which are going to sit, call the user service, and then wait to see if any of the code changes. And it's taking its sweet time, because I think it's checking on the internet to see if it needs to get updated versions of the images. Okay. Given that we don't have that much time while we're waiting, let me just talk briefly about how Node Inspector works. When you run Node, there is a debug flag. What that debug flag does is it tells Node to open up port 5858 and listen for anyone who wants to talk the V8 protocol for talking about debugging. Now, Chrome knows how to talk the Chrome debugging protocol. So the Chrome developer tools, when you're doing your UI development, know they talk a certain protocol. The problem is these two protocols are different. So what Node Inspector does is it sits there, it talks to Node, and it exposes the developer tools on port 8080 to Chrome. So when I hit Node Inspector from Chrome, what I'm seeing, that web page, is not really the native developer tools. They've kind of taken the HTML, the JavaScript, everything that runs that web page, and they're just presenting it in a browser. So that's what Node Inspector is doing. It's a bridge between one protocol and another protocol. So it's a very smart piece of code, but what you might find is that sometimes all of the features that are there in the debug, the genuine full-fat debugger tools, maybe they're not in Node Inspector yet because they have to periodically update it. Okay, so Docker Compose Up is still not uh, done its thing. I think it is the, uh, the network. So let's move on to the... Next slide. I'll give it one more try. Don't know if you can see my screen now. Let's go back to it. So, do we have anything running? <laughs> I called it Dicker. Um, Okay, let's try one more time. Docker compose up. So Docker is a pain in the ass if you've got poor Wi-Fi or if you're in hotels. But anyway, we're running a little bit low on time. So instead, we'll just have to move on. If it, if it runs, it runs, and that's great. So if you're interested, you can take a look at the source code and go all the way to... Um, Demo 3. In Demo 3, I show you how you can debug the, the test code as well. So I'm using Mocha. So Node Debug as a program, all it does is it starts the Node Inspector executable, and then it opens up Node with the debug flag. Now, if I'm using something like Mocha, I can't quite do that because Mocha has its own set of flags. So in that scenario, what you have to do is, if I go to Demo 3, Let's say I want to do the same um, node inspector trick with Mocha. So what I would do in my package JSON would be for the debug command, I just need to manually start the node inspector process like this. So that starts the process, which is there as working as a bridge, waiting for something to talk to it and waiting to spit that data out to Chrome. And then I would just run Mocha with the debug flag. 
and I would pass it whatever I want to debug. Now that trick works for just about anything you've got. It works for grunts, it works for gulp, it works for all of these tools which use Node.js under the hood. So almost any command line program you use, which is built on Node.js, if you look at its documentation, it will expose a debug flag, which will just under the hood start it using the debug flag for Node, which means you can use Node Inspector to debug almost anything. Has Docker Compose got anywhere yet? No, it hasn't. Oh man, sorry about that, guys. But it's how it goes sometimes with live coding. At least you saw some stuff. So let's get towards the wrapping up stage, and then we can open for questions. So hopefully, even though the Docker stuff didn't work, blame the internet. It was probably me. Hopefully, you've seen that Node Inspector is very, very quick and easy to use, and you can quickly start debugging your code in, in, in little time at all. And just get your hands dirty with it, practice with it, learn how to use these tools. You can take heap snapshots, so you can profile CPU usage. So if I'm building an HTTP server, I can take a heap snapshot, click, and then do a web request and take another snapshot. I can then use the deep developer tools to compare the difference between the two snapshots. So what objects were allocated in between that time for the request, which haven't been deallocated. So I can find memory leaks, and you'll find deep and detailed articles about that on my website as well. Some interesting stuff that's happening in the future. The, um, there's native support coming for Node. So there's going to be a new flag that they add, probably in Node 7, which will be dash dash inspect. When you run Node with that flag, and they're actively working on this at the moment, Chrome can just tie in directly. There's no need for this Node inspector to run as a bridge, which means you get the latest and greatest Chrome developer tool, tools and a truly native experience. But it doesn't mean that anything you do, do with Node inspector is, is pointless, because all of those skills about how to debug your code, step through your code, use breakpoints, live editing, all absolutely apply. It's just it gets a little bit smoother. There's lots of more complicated JavaScript, JavaScript stuff coming. And debugging is going to be even more important when you've got things like yield or async, when you've got classes and native promises. There's more complicated stuff. People are going to be writing more complicated programs. So debugging that is going to be very, very important. And as you do more and more things like containers and DevOps 2.0 and Docker, being able to take those skills that you've got with debugging and then apply that to stuff that's running in a container or even running on another server is very important. All of the stuff I showed you there, you can debug Node.js code on a remote server if you want to, using exactly the same tools and tricks. You don't want to do that in production, but it's a useful trick. So as a cheat sheet that you can take away with you, this is all you need to do. Install Node Inspector and either do Node Debug or just kick off the Node Inspector process and start Node with the debug flag. If you're using Docker, um, we didn't get there with this. We're constrained by time and it not working properly. There's one other flag you need to add, which is webhost 000. That's basically telling it that I want to be able to expose that API uh, UI to the outside world, outside of the container. And um, keep an eye out for this, Node Inspect. That's going to be written about more and more, and people are going to be working on the code more. That's the, that's the kind of future of it. Also, um, as a quick request from my, my partner and I, please do, if you're interested, take a look at our website, Support for Nepal. We're doing a big fundraising campaign at the moment for some work that we're doing there. And with that, I'm going to uh, open up for questions. Awesome. If there are any questions. All right. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we have time just for one more session. Um, just one more question, right over there. Can someone get Pinak in a mic? Yeah, sure. You can actually scream. <laughs> yeah, or just yell. There Did Docker work? Is it running yet? Still not. Hi, Dave. Uh, it was awesome. Thank you. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I right, think the so best bit was when Compose didn't work at all, but hey ho. We've, right. we've paid him pretty So, my well. question is uh, how Competitive is Node.js as compared to the other upcoming languages like uh, Elixir, Haskell, you know? Yeah, um, it's, it's a very good question. I think you should consider it just one of the many tools in your toolbox. So shortly I'm going to be writing a, a part of a credit underwriting engine um, for a project at work. I'm probably not going to use Node for that. But Haskell, like you said, would be ideal because it's going to be a very functional system and input comes in and input goes out. For some things, Node is the ideal choice because it's very, very fast and quick. So for example, if I'm taking a web request in and passing it on somewhere else, I can do that in a few lines of Node code. I can also do it in a few lines of Go um, or even D or something like this. I don't think they necessarily need to be competitive. It's just one more tool in your toolbox for, uh, for doing development. If you need very, very lightweight, quick startup code, 
then it's a great choice, as are, as are many other frameworks or, or platforms. So is uh, startup the only good use case for Node.js and then you, know, make, you make stuff with you know, other tech stack? I think a good use case for Node.js is if you've got a lot of JavaScript talent on your team, then um, people who know JavaScript can write Node.js code quite quickly and quite effectively. Certainly for writing highly uh, high volume web servers, the concurrency model for Node makes it easy to write very, very fast and powerful server applications without burning through a lot of CPU. So high volume server applications that need to run in containers and need to run very quickly with low startup times, I'd say it would be a, an extremely attractive thing to look into. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Manaka. Cheers, guys. Thanks, Dave.